Hello everyone, today I've got a very, very, very special video for you all today. Around a year and a half ago, I had just started YouTube and I would just made my first little mini-series breaking down Sack Squid's Splatoon Iceberg. It was my very first little taste of success on YouTube and holds a very special place in my heart. However, that mini-series was also my first dip into the YouTube pool and the quality of those videos is extremely low to the standard I hold myself to now. So, what better way to celebrate how far that I've come than to reintroduce or introduce you all to Sack Squid's Splatoon Iceberg. This iceberg covers all sorts of weird and hidden things throughout Splatoon's history. Whether it be things from in the game or stuff going on outside of the game in Splatoon's development. But that's enough introduction. Without further ado, let's break down the Splatoon Iceberg. Corporatism in Inkopolis. This entry is kind of just about how big corporations are all over the Splatoon world, some having more power than others, especially like brands like Squid Force that are the main sponsor of Turf War, and basically just fund all the goings on in the Splatoon world. Inkopolis Plaza Tower can be seen from Inkopolis Square. This entry is pretty self-explanatory, and if you go right over behind the food truck around this little corner right here, you can actually see Inkopolis Plaza's tower from Inkopolis Square, just to kind of show how close things are together. Squid Sisters waving at the player. This one is a pretty well-known one, but in Splatoon 1, if you stand by the Squid Sisters long enough, they will actually wave to you. Chinese mobile ripoffs. So obviously a ton of popular games will get ripoffs from countries like China that don't have big access to a lot of Western media. So a bunch of companies in China went off and made little Splatoon ripoffs that are really poorly made games, but they kind of resemble the main like appeal of Splatoon to try to cash in on the market that exists over in Western countries. Tofu and Rabbits were the originally the main characters of Splatoon. Actually, there were more than just Tofu and Rabbits originally planned. At one point in Splatoon's development, Mario characters were actually used too. This was before Hisashi Nogami and his team decided to use squids to shoot ink, which sounds pretty obvious now, but at the time they didn't know that. But originally in the very early stages of Splatoon's development, Tofu blocks were used instead of inklings, and at some point after the Tofu, but before the Mario characters even, rabbits were used. Then Mario characters were used, then these looking weird kind of squid things right here, and then we got Inklings. Tiny animations in Sunken Scrolls. So in both Splatoon 1 and 2, in the little like corners of the Sunken Scrolls, when you scroll through them really fast, they make a little flipbook animation. I can only show you the one from Splatoon 2 because I don't have a Wii U, but here you go. We Bear Bears promo. So this one is pretty high for being so obscure. But in around 2017, the Cartoon Network show We Bear Bears had a promo for Splatoon 2 where a bunch of characters were all getting together and playing Splatoon 2. Go. Grizz, don't fall for his tricks! Behind you! Inklings and Octolings can't swim in water even though they are sea creatures. So this has to do with how in lore Inklings and Octolings evolved. The way they evolved out of water made their cell membranes really weak to water to the point where they would basically explode if too much water broke in. So they can live on land, but due to how they evolved and some little glitch in their evolution, they weren't able to go back to the water. It would basically just make them explode. The Inkling skull bandana is a little bit of a paradox. You see, Inklings don't have bones. Although in the Inkling skull bandana, it shows what would be an Inkling skeleton, once again, even though they don't have bones. Um, I've got no explanation here, just, it, it's weird, and here you go. The Octotune bonus track is a weird little track of just speaking from characters in Octo Expansion, and I'll play a little clip of it here. There's no explanation as to why this exists or what it says because obviously we can't understand them, but it's here in the game for some reason, I don't know, maybe it's supposed to like mimic how in some songs or albums you can hear people talking in the end about stuff, so maybe it's supposed to be like that, but who knows. Flying Zapfish is also pretty self-explanatory, it's just about how sometimes you can see the great Zapfish just flying through the air sometimes and on some maps, so uh, here you go. The Splatoon 1 apartment is just a little nod to how when you start up Splatoon 1 on the Wii U, you can see like an apartment that an Inkling would live in, 
and the Splatoon community has never let go of this since. Real birds and insects. So in some places in Splatoon, you can find real birds and insects that have survived the Great Flood that happened back before Splatoon started, and that they've survived. Obviously, they're like birds, they can like go up on mountains and stuff. Insects is a little more weird. I guess they could have probably found a way too. But birds obviously makes a lot of sense as they can fly to higher ground. Inkopolis Plaza Out of Bounds glitch is how someone found a way to just glitch out of bounds in Splatoon 1, and I'll show a little clip of it right here. Hashtag Free Melee got a Splatoon tournament cancelled, so this is a really cool and interesting entry that everyone should know about because it really just shows the extent of how low Nintendo can go. So a while back there was a Smash Melee tournament that happened during quarantine where they used a mod called Slippy to allow for better online gameplay for Melee. And Nintendo didn't like this because they weren't able to profit off of this because obviously if you're going to be using this mod, you need to be using an emulator to play it, which Nintendo can't profit from. So Nintendo sent a cease and desist order to Slippy, and they had to stop using the mod, which in turn cancelled this melee tournament. Although, Nintendo had an upcoming Splatoon 2 tournament, and in that tournament, a bunch of players changed their names to free melee and stuff around that hashtag, which caused Nintendo to abruptly end the live stream and finish the actual tournament without being streamed. Human Skeleton and Sunken Scrolls just kind of goes more to back up the fact that humans all kind of died out. And however, you can see a human playing a Wii U, and because of the way that this controller is set up, they are playing Splatoon, which don't even get me started on that or we could be here all day. The Ferris Wheel from Wahoo World is visible in Inkopolis Plaza, and this is really cool and important because Wahoo World wasn't added until Splatoon 2, Although later on in this video, you're going to see how weird Wahoo World and Splatoon 1 really are. City in Bluefin Depot is abandoned. So this entry is really cool because the city that we can see in Bluefin Depot resembles an actual place in Japan called Hashima Island, which is also another abandoned city, so we can actually get a location from in the real world of where Bluefin Depot is. That's it. Squid Research Lab gear in Splatoon 1 Test Fire. So this is cool because whenever you would play the Splatoon 1 test fire, if you came across an actual developer on Splatoon 1, they would be wearing the Splatoon Squid Research Lab lab coat, which would indicate that you were playing with the developer at the time. Calamari Incantation was played in the Splatoon 1 Final Fest. So this entry is all about how, obviously, Calamari Incantation was played during the Splatoon 1 Final Fest, which is weird because at the time there was only one track for the Splatoon 1 Splatfest, which was Ink Me Up. It's kind of similar how to in Splatoon 2, during the Final Fest they added a bunch of songs that were originally just part of the campaign into the actual multiplayer sound list. Like how Shark Bites was added in Splatoon 2, Calamari Incantation was added in Splatoon 1, just to kind of like emphasize how big of a deal the Splatfest was. Pearl and Marina are possibly lesbians. This kind of comes from the fact that like you can see Marina being super close with Pearl and vice versa, and you know, they're they're probably gay squids, and that's okay. Pearl was originally an Octoling. This is probably one of the coolest things on this entry. When I first made this, I was shocked to find this out. It really just broadened my perspective to how much I didn't know about Splatoon lore at the time. But if you didn't know, before Off the Hook was made, they were originally called Tentacles, and I believe they still are in the Japanese version of the game. But Tentacles originally was supposed to be the opposite of the Squid Sisters, the Squid Sisters both being Inklings, Tentacles was supposed to be two Octolings, and Pearl's Octoling design is so much better than what we actually got, and it's a shame that we didn't get this. Octarian Power Crisis is about how the Octarians constantly steal Zapfish to deal with their lack of power. Sometimes they steal the great zapfish just to do silly things like the Octobots, or they stole Kali to become more popular among Inklings and to get more reputation among the Octolings they already had. But really, the main issue behind why they're stealing zapfish is because they're dealing with their own power crisis and don't have any source to turn to unlike the Inklings who have made an alliance with the great zapfish and the many zapfish that we use in the city. 
Rival Octolings are mind controlled is a fan theory that states that the weird eyewear around the rival Octolings are hypno shades similar to the ones that Callie wore. This theory is, I believe, in my head canon accurate, although it has never 100% been confirmed. So while it looks pretty true, don't just, uh, just remember to take it with a grain of salt. Pearl's hidden shockwave ability refers to a few things. Number one, her killer whale is obviously much more powerful than everyone else's who has ever had one in Splatoon. And in Marina's chat logs, it's referred to how Pearl would go to Mount Nantai to practice her voice, which honestly can be interpreted as her just either singing or, in my opinion, and the honestly more likely option, her killer shockwave voice. And I believe in the Splatoon manga, it's also referenced that Pearl has a shockwave ability that makes her kind of different. Oh, and I totally almost forgot that in the Sunken Scrolls in Splatoon 2, it's talked about how Pearl destroyed a stage, and I totally forget this all the time. But originally, when Splatoon 2 was first revealed, the bridge in the reef was made out of wood, and it was confirmed that when Splatoon 2 finally launched, between the times of when this game actually was revealed and when it was launched, that bridge was changed because Pearl's voice destroyed the bridge. That change in bridge material is actually a canon event. Hidden Sea Cucumbers refers to how all throughout Octo Expansion you can find tons of little sea cucumbers everywhere. And I believe this kind of might have to do with the fact that there are multiple sea cucumbers, as in the main character in Octo Expansion. I believe I saw that in Araska's video at some point, although like maybe don't quote me on that one. But yes, there are hidden sea cucumbers all throughout Octo Expansion. Whether or not they are THE sea cucumber, uh, I'm not exactly 100% sure. Number 007 EDC versus number E1A307. So, this is an unused Splatfest color combination of a light blue and a yellow. The light blue was the Alpha team and the yellow was a Bravo team. And I believe that this color combination went totally unused all throughout Splatoon 2. Callie and Marie's families refers to the very few amount of relatives we know that Callie and Marie are related to. So obviously the Cuttlefish family is a very powerful family, and though we don't know if that's actually Callie and Marie's last name, they are related to Captain Cuttlefish and all of his relatives. However, what most people don't know is that they are also somehow related to Tony Kensa. Marina's landlord is a narwhal is the biggest example of how bad translation can really be in Splatoon. So, during the Narwhal vs. Unicorn Splatfest, Marina says that her landlord is a narwhal when Pearl says that she doesn't believe that narwhals exist. However, this line does not exist anywhere in the Japanese version and contradicts the fact that narwhals are mammals and should not exist. So, they probably don't exist unless Nintendo wants to do a lot of trolling with their lore that they've already established, which it's not above Nintendo, they could totally do it. But as of right now, narwhals do not exist and just remains as the biggest example of how bad the translation can really get. Jellyfish are second class citizens. So if you aren't aware, most jellyfish besides Jelfonzo and Jelonzo are a part of a hive mind of jellyfish that do lots of dirty jobs like maintaining stages. We don't exactly know for sure if they are a full on second class society because we can see them doing normal things like going shopping and such, but like, it, it's not really been confirmed, although it has kind of been hinted at before, that they might not have all of the same, I don't know, like, status as Inklings do. Hackers and X-Rank leaderboards has to do with an event that just one time happened where a bunch of people, or one person, I don't really know for sure, got together and hacked their way on the Splatoon X-Rank boards and got all four slots saying please add anti-cheat. Uh, however, this could refer to people in the Splatoon community like Haxi who have kind of been outed from the community for going through in public lobbies and hacking to make YouTube videos on it. Just like some not good stuff like that. The Great Zapfish can be seen swimming in Piranha Pit. This one is very self-explanatory and here he is doing his thing. The Rocket Game Mode was a scrapped ranked mode in Splatoon 2 where players would go up, shoot this like tower thing, which they called the Rocket, to get it to advance an objective, and I assumed this mode was cut because it was kind of too much just like tower control in a sense, and would just kind of leave the player vulnerable just shooting this one obelisk for a while. Jumping Guy and Hammer Guy were two classes of cut enemy types from Splatoon 1, and I don't think there's any footage anywhere to be found of what they actually looked like just that we know they exist from lines in the game's code. 
8 ball game mode was also another scrapped ranked mode that we can kind of see the remnants of in Octo Expansion and all these stupid 8 ball missions. Uh, basically the whole goal here was just to push an 8 ball into one of the goals on the opposite team's map. It's pretty, uh, self-explanatory. Lil Judd is a clone of Judd is kind of self-explanatory too, but when you look past the depths of how self-explanatory the name is, we see a real issue starting here. So, in the Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion relationship chart, we can see Little Judd's relationship with Judd, and there is no line stemming from Judd to Lil Judd. However, there is a line from Lil Judd to Judd, and that line reads, I've known from the moment of my birth that I'm just a replica of you. How could you ever understand my feelings? And in his little box there, it quite comically says he has an inferiority complex, which, if you are kind of not aware, it's an inferiority complex. Which means that Lil Judd has some not-so-well-placed feelings towards Judd. Which we could see play out in Splatoon 3. There have kind of been hints at it with how important Judd and Lil Judd seem to be to the plot of Return of the Mammalians. Octo Samurai is a fan of Kali. At first, doesn't seem like a whole big deal. Like, obviously, yeah, it's in the name. He's a fan of Kali. And here's an image of uh, him <laughs> being a little Kali stan. But what this kind of goes to show is a little deeper. The reason that DG Octavio kidnapped Kali was primarily to get more support from his Octarians. And obviously we can see here in the lore that it's paying off. He's a big fan of Kali, so DG Octavio is working to actively better the relationship between him and his troops to boost morale. Which morale is probably in short supply during the events of Octo Valley and Octo Canyon, considering how big of a power supply issue that they have there. Marie's pet was a gift that she got from Callie back when they were children, and here it is right here and it's all cute. Splatoon 1 Playable Octolinks is a little rabbit hole we're gonna travel down real quick. So, originally, rival Octolinks were not playable until someone found a way to mod the player character model into a rival Octoling, where some discoveries were made pretty quickly. Number one, underneath the Octarian's goggles, you could actually see what their eyes looked like and they were all weird and like kind of greenish yellow and stuff like that. And you could never actually take these players into an online lobby. When you did, you would get banned from the game. However, later on in a different Splatoon 1 update, when you went to use Kraken as an Octoling, the model would change so the tentacles are more curved. Why do this if the intention was not to have the players play as Octarians in Splatoon 1? So little theories have been suggested that at one point, maybe Octolings were originally supposed to be played as in some update in Splatoon 1. And we've known before that Nogami did originally want Octolings to be playable in Splatoon 1, and even the base game of Splatoon 2, until shifting playable Octolings to Octo Expansion. Splatoon's Tumblr page in the Splatoon 1 apartment. So, a little extra detail that not a lot of people noticed is that on the laptop on the Splatoon 1 apartment when you open up Splatoon 1, it's actually the old Tumblr page that Nintendo used to run to post Splatoon news. Agent 3 in Octo Expansion has no ink tank, so try not to think about this one much, it's just a little, like, thing Nintendo missed, that they just didn't give Agent 3 an ink tank. Maybe it would have like not looked well with the cape, so they decided it would look cooler just not to have it and to have the cape instead, but there's there's no ink tank there, so how she's shooting at you, we will never know. <laughs> Amosis Schellendorf is a pretty big key character in Splatoon lore. He is Sheldon's grandfather, the original opener of Ammo Knight, and he actually made the Custom Splattershot Jr., Kelp Splat Charger, Aerospray MG, Aerospray RG, New Squiffer, Dynamo Roller, Gold Dynamo Roller, Hero Charger, Hero Roller, and Hero Shot. The Exorcist ability was a cut ability in Splatoon 2 that would have given an increased respawn time and special gauge penalty to the person who splatted you last. And obviously you can see that this is a little bit of an overpowered ability right here, so obviously Nintendo cut this from the game. Fried Egg vs. Omelette is a Splatfest placeholder image and not actually a real thing. This was kind of discovered when the game was first, when Splatoon 2 was first dropped. And it kind of just went like and flew under the radar for a few years till back around 2020. It was kind of rediscovered by the public and everyone had a little freak out over if we were going to get another Splatfest about Fried Egg versus Omelette. 
until it was confirmed that this was just a placeholder image. And like, obviously, it doesn't look like a normal Splatfest image anyway. Like, the drawing for the fried egg and the omelette don't look like what we've seen with Splatfest teams. So, yeah, this is just a placeholder image. Why Inklings and Octolings have breasts? So, I'm pretty sure it's all but confirmed that they're just muscles and they're not like actually like boobs. I was gonna make a boob joke here, but I forgot to write one in time, so uh, boobs. Callie and Marie are Cuddle. So, this is just a fan theory that gained a lot of traction because like Captain Cuddlefish makes like joint cracking sounds and it looks like he's got bones here. Um, you're kind of forgetting the oversight that this is just a kid's game, and what's funnier, to have Captain Cuttlefish look completely plain, or to make him look like a dried up old man that makes crackly bone noises whenever he moves. Th this is literally just him being designed for a kid's game. It it's fine. They just wanted to make him look funny. MSN 109 is this really creepy looking mask. That was originally going to be a reward for defeating NILS statue, as obviously it looks like its eyes, and you can see why this didn't exactly make it into the game. Chum can be kept as pet comes from this really stupid Nintendo Switch Online Splatnet 2 app. When you ink enough points to get yourself the Central Park part of the little ink challenge thing, you get this image of an inkling walking a chum. I think it's pretty easy to say that this image is not canon as the Inkling is also walking through Central Park, which would most likely still be underwater considering how low the sea level is on New York City, so yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty obvious that this one is not canon. Kraken in Splatoon 2 is this really cool mod that someone did, where they literally modded the Kraken into Splatoon 2, and here it is, and it looks super functional. The answer to kid versus squid, it, it's squid, sorry. Degasso Band Brothers P Contest So, Degasso Band Brothers P is a music game exclusive to Japan where people were asked to submit Octotune remixes in order to promote Octo Expansion for this little contest that was held in the game. There's not much to this one, it was just a little contest that went on to promote Octo Expansion. Deadfish missing entries 3, 7, 10, 15, 17, and 18. So these most likely don't actually exist at all in the game, and Nintendo probably cut these numbers just to make the soundtrack look a little creepy, because like, ooh, we're underground and it's in it's in the deep sea and our, our artist doesn't have uh, lots of odd numbers, maybe they can't count or something. No, these never existed and they probably are just doing that to be creepy. Raspy Voice and Salmon Run Shoal. So, I'm not exactly sure about this whole thing, but what I do know is that in the E3 demo of Salmon Run, it wasn't actually confirmed who Mr. Grizz yet, so Nintendo had this placeholder with a darkened out Grizz and that just called him Raspy Voice, so I think that's what this might be about. Ruins of Arc Polaris is a failed space colonization attempt. This one's pretty obvious just by like looking around the map and seeing the scenery, like there's a downed spaceship here. This was probably to do with, and especially since there's actual English all over the map, probably to do with when the Great Flood happened, humans were probably trying to take off to space to try to like not die in the flood and they failed at that. This was just another one of the humans attempts to get out of the Great Flood, like building the domes that the Octarians now live in. That was made by the humans so they could try to survive the Great Flood. Spike and Merch eat super sea snails is kind of just this the one thing Nintendo's always been hinting at with all the like emptied out shells from Super Sea Snails around and the screwdrivers around them too by Spike. So yeah, it is more likely than not that we are just feeding them to Spike and Merch. Exclusive music for Koro Koro Gear trailers. Yes, if you did not know, when the Japanese players got the exclusive Koro Koro Gear, they actually got exclusive music in those trailers too, which I will play for you right now.
The inside of a griller is this really creepy image that shows that when you can like glitch in and see the inside of the griller there are chum being cooked alive in there. Which kind of goes along with the Salmonid's whole culture thing of wanting to be eaten and seeing it as honorable. Which is still really weird but you know it's a nice little detail from Nintendo to kind of back that claim up with something we can see in game. Turf War Indoctrinates Kids is kind of about how the Great Turf War was an actual turf war fought for real reasons and now Inklings today just play turf war for fun and oh it's maybe it's government indoctrination. It's it's most likely not it's something that's just turned into a sport like I, I really don't I, I can see why people would think that but it's really just viewed as something as simple as like soccer or football. Ha, huh, I said soccer and football to confuse British and American people. Location of the Interagent 3 fight is something that's never been confirmed, but I've got my little theory on it that it all takes place in Agent 8's head and that it's made up of multiple places that she's seen before, multiple items she's seen before, and of course, Agent 3, due to her wanting to impress Agent 3. Unused gear in Mario Maker is a really cool look back about some hidden Splatoon 1, like, pre-release footage, footage, not really footage, just items we found, within Super Mario Maker for some reason, but you can see all this old gear right here, including my favorite, this like, ink revolver thing that never made it to the game, I'm assuming this didn't make it to the game, because how do you really make a revolver not look like an actual gun? Like, even with the little tube it's got on it here, it still looks like a normal gun. DJ Octavio's human form is something that we have only seen in lore and will probably never see in game just because Nintendo probably wants to be like cryptic here. But we can see that he looks like a samurai almost. But once again, it's probably something we'll never end up seeing actually in game. Ringing Phone in Inkblot Art Academy is something I think people blow out of proportion so much like, oh, there's a there's a phone ringing in Inkblot Art Academy, who could be calling? Does it matter? Who, who really cares here? It's just something in the game. I don't think it's something nearly as creepy as like the fact that you can hear rival Octolings giggling in Spawn Beacon. So like, is this really what we want to focus on? NILS statue is the Statue of Liberty. Actually, it isn't. It's a statue of David, but I can understand why you would think it's the Statue of Liberty. Don't feel bad for thinking that, because I thought that too at one point. Ghostly Giggles in Museum D'Alfonsino. Now, this is something really cool, because you're going to possibly see it again when Museum D'Alfonsino comes back to Splatoon 3. So, if you play at a Splatfest recon, and you go by these statues, you can hear them giggle, and I'll play a little clip of it right now. This interests me so much because it'll be cool to see if Nintendo ports this feature back to Splatoon 3 when they port back the map. Unused Now or Never Splatoon 3 E3 demo is something really cool because the original Now or Never sounds nothing like what we have in Splatoon before. And here's a little clip of it now. It's just really cool to see what Nintendo was originally planning for music before they actually dropped Splatoon 1. Demonic Screams in Splatoon 1 boss rooms is this like screaming that you can hear that I'll play right now. And what's interesting about this is because of the position that Splatoon is currently in. We are going to a location that isn't Inkopolis, and obviously in the campaign we're gonna have boss fights, so it'll be really cool to find out if we can actually hear these screams still, because if we're hearing them in Splatsville, then it will deconfirm the popular theory that these screams we're hearing are from the deep sea metro of Octarians getting grinded up into the primordial ooze, so we've got a real opportunity to really test this theory soon. Mr. Grizz is a grizzly bear. Shut up! Shut up. No, he's not. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. No. No. Bad. No. 
unused big sanitized octo trooper is this really looking goofy big 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 boy octo trooper who is supposed to be a boss in octo expansion at some point or maybe just a test character but all he'd really do is just kind of shoot at you and look at it look at his little legs they're so small The Professor is really just kind of the main guy behind everything that's ever happened in the Splatoon world since the Great Flood, and honestly kind of for the Great Flood when you really think about it. So he is responsible for making Judd immortal. Uh, he kind of did this to try to preserve Judd's life before putting him in cryo sleep. Um, he used Judd to help determine which countries should attack which during the many civil wars and the three other world wars. Because apparently Judd was like super good at helping countries determine where they should attack, so really he's behind the nuclear bomb going off in Antarctica too, or at least he triggered the events to get there. Um, he is responsible for making Tartar, allegedly, kinda, sorta, maybe, it was never actually confirmed, but like, there's only one other super smart professor we know of, and Tartar claimed to be made by one, so it was most likely him. He's kind of just got his foot everywhere in the Splatoon world, and despite multiple fan theories and popular fan theories with that, the Professor as of now does indeed look like he died in the Flood. As we can see his skull with his little glasses on around him in the Splatoon comic that depicted how the world got to the state it was in. So yeah, he is most likely dead. Hidden Message in the 2020 artwork is my absolute favorite entry here because it was kind of our first real tease that we were getting Splatoon 3. So in the have a nice 2020 artwork here, and that's it, that didn't end up happening, we see in the waves here, it was cryptically written, save our salmons, which originally made the Splatoon community think, oh, are we going to be working with the salmonids now, or is something bad happening to them? And we got the first Splatoon 3 teaser, where we saw Agent 3 with a salmonid, you know, we kind of just all went a little ballistic, because holy crap, it looked like it was right, and then we see Salmon runs back, and we don't really have a side here, so Lord only knows what's going on over there. Splatoon 2 collab with Fortnite was something we thought we knew what was going on, and we didn't end up knowing what was going on. So around June 2019, it's so like, holy crap, this is three years ago now, there were leaked data mined files from Fortnite of characters that were titled Squid Kid, and obviously what other game has Squid Kids in it. And the Splatoon community all kind of thought there was going to be some big collab with Splatoon and Fortnite, which honestly, I think it would have been really cool, despite what you may think about Fortnite. Like, Splatoon representation everywhere is good, so I honestly wish it did end up happening. If it was originally intended to be Splatoon, I wonder what made it fizzle out. Like, we know that um, Metroid was also supposed to have a collab with Fortnite that fizzled out, so I don't know, maybe Nintendo being protective of its IPs. Deep Sea Metro Destination, I think, is a joke entry because there isn't really a final destination of the Deep Sea Metro. It more exists to just, like, bring people around to, like, test sites and stuff like that. And, I mean, it brings people to more than just test sites. We already know that. But, like, there isn't really an actual destination here. You could say it's the Promised Land, but until you remember that when Agent 8 got to the Promised Land, they did that by breaking out of all of the test locations and not by riding the deep sea metro there, so it probably isn't the promised land either. Ambience and Shifty Stations is a really cool entry. So when you go to recon the Shifty Stations during Splatfest, which obviously you can't anymore because there are no more Splatfests, you would hear this track that I will play a clip of now. And what is cool about this is that when this track was actually data mined from the game, we found that the track was around 5 minutes long. This is in contrary to all of the other songs in Splatoon that are around like 2-ish minutes long and they get looped for rank battles, or now or never kicks in. No, this track was made to be like longer than 5 minutes, for no reason, even though the player will never hear the full 5 minute version. So why make a 5 minute version? for something that people will never hear. It's really cool and really weird, and we'll never get an answer for it either. Salmonids and Octarians trade with power eggs. So if you didn't know, a little cool tidbit of Splatoon lore is that there are so many power eggs everywhere or you get power eggs when defeating Octarians because they have a trade agreement with the Salmonids that allows the Octarians to give the Salmonids some of their technology 
and in exchange the Octarians get power eggs to help deal with their electricity crisis. And we can see their technology in salmonids like the Scrapper. So yeah, it's just a little tidbit of lore right there, and obviously the Inklings don't do the same thing because we don't have those trade agreements, so naturally we just break into salmonid territory, massacre all the salmonids, and then take all of their stuff. Because we're the good guys, remember that. And this is a kid's game. Salmon Run was tested and developed on the Wii U, so I don't have actual images to fully back this up, but what I do have is a confirmation from this iceberg's creator, Sack Squid, that this is true, and I got this confirmation when I first made this iceberg over a year ago. And while I don't have 100% proof of this, I do have a pretty strong smoking gun to confirm this. So, a while back in this video, I said that Wahoo World was important to Splatoon 1. This is because Wahoo World was also tested and developed on Splatoon 1 on the Wii U, and we have screenshots of this today. Here is one right now. So while you don't have to believe me when I say that Salmon Run was tested and developed on Wii U, there are people that have seen it before that have confirmed it, and we have pretty strong evidence to suggest that it may have been tested and developed on the Wii U, just like Wahoo World was. And it is so freaking cool to see this much of Splatoon 2's development being shown here. Unused minigame in the Hero Mode trailer. This refers to this little clip we see right here of Agent 3 in this like 2D pixelated game shooting Octarians. This was most likely just a cinematic made to like be cool in the trailer rather than actually being a little mini game you can play through. So I don't think this was ever real. I think this clip was just made to be cool in the trailer. Fax Machine Religion kind of like connects together that the world of Inkopolis and the Inklings might actually be a theocracy because the Splatfest is treated in such high regards and really, what it, it, what it just is, is just human information being beamed back to this fax machine, and the Inklings decide to have a big, big event throughout the whole freaking city to determine which side is better, and what kind of puts this together is the fact that the winning team's side legally becomes the law of the land, which becomes a little bit of an issue when we have things like Chicken vs. Egg 2020, where Chicken won and states that the chicken came before the egg which Marina kind of goes back and forth with Pearl on before Pearl finally states that now it is the law that chicken came before egg, even though there were scientists that proved the egg came first. So it's probably a big religion there. I don't know, I guess. Ghost Faces in Inkblot Art Academy is a really stupid entry where people thought they saw faces on the walls when really it's just specks of like dust and stuff and light reflecting in certain areas to make your brain think you saw a face when in reality you didn't. Ten thousand seven dead octolings is the idea that since Agent Eight is test subject ten thousand eight, then there's got to be ten thousand seven other octolings that came before Agent Eight, and they're all dead now because they made the primordial ooze. Um, it's most likely that it's not just octolings. There are probably ten thousand seven dead creatures or around that number because we know other people that might have been doing test subject things like Agent 3 survived, although it wasn't really confirmed if Agent 3 was a test subject, so who knows. But it's not really all just Octolings because we know that standard Octo Troopers were also getting sanitized and so they were probably being put through tests as well. So it's more likely to be like a really high amount of just dead Octarians with some Octolings in there too. So yes, there are probably thousands of dead Octarians and Octolings. And remember, this is a kid's game. This is rated E, 10 and up. Thanks, Nintendo. Fortnite copying Splatoon 2 really isn't that big of a deal because, like, Fortnite copies everyone, so honestly, who really cares? The Promised Land was always a lie. So this is, I, I guess it's technically true because, like, when Tartar tells you that you're going to the Promised Land, he really means the blender and you're, you're gonna die painfully and we're gonna turn your blood into ooze and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I guess that's technically true. Screenshot of early Inkopolis Plaza hidden in the Splatoon Global Test Fire. So this is a really cool look back on the history of Splatoon 1's development. We can see this really old image of Inkopolis Plaza before the game actually launched when the Splatoon Global Test Fire was data mined. And it, it's really cool. It's really cool to see what came before the actual plaza and it's really cool to see how Splatoon development was going on. 
Hacker named Agent 4 with white hair in Splatoon 1. So this is really blown out of proportion. So obviously yes, this person definitely hacked their game. They have white ink hair, which doesn't exist in Splatoon 1. And their name is Agent 4, and this was before Splatoon 2. So the conclusion here was, oh my gosh, what if this person was like from Nintendo or had developer insight and they're teasing Splatoon 2? Well, let's step back and think about that first real quick. So how many times in Splatoon 1 or 2 have you seen players named Agent 1, Agent 2, Agent 3, Agent 4, Agent 8, stuff like that? So, is it really that big of a stretch for someone to have made their name Agent 4, but have no idea what Splatoon 2 is going to be about? Obviously, Agent 4 was a safe number to pick because 4 comes right after 3, and at the time, between Splatoon 1 and 2, we had no idea that Nintendo would just go on and skip agent numbers like they did going from Agent 4 to Agent 8. Like, this couldn't happen now, because we know that they're just reusing the name Agent 3. So like someone making, like if we had a hacker in Splatoon 2 that had different colored ink hair that we can't get in the game and their name was like Agent 5, we'd now know that they just made their name that and like wanted to look cool. So that's basically what happened here. And it was more of a lucky coincidence that their name happened to be the agent from the next game more than it is that they had developer insight. Sea levels rise after World War V. So this is another little bit of Splatoon lore here. So if you didn't know, there were multiple civil wars throughout lots of countries and three more world wars. And during the last world war, one country of unknown origin dropped a nuclear bomb on Antarctica, which resulted in the flooding that caused the Splatoon events. So yeah, this is just a little bit of Splatoon lore here if you didn't know. Uh, yeah, the massive world war caused Splatoon. This is a kid's game. 14,000 years in the future is the estimate of time between when the world wars all finished and the flood happened and the events in Inkopolis. I'm pretty sure it's actually more like 12,000 years though. As in Splatoon 2's uh, Frosty Fest, we got an item called New Year's Glasses DX that reads out 2019. So it was probably around 2,000-ish years now which would, I believe, place the Splatoon timeline at the year 12,022. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. So Splatoon 3 takes place around a year and a half after Splatoon 2's final fest. So I believe that would put us right around 12,021, 1220-ish. Yeah, I think the Splatoon timeline is a little bit behind ours now. Whereas in the past beforehand, their timeline is always synchronized with ours, just like 12,000 years in the future. 10,000-ish. Mm, I don't really know. Allegory for race and gender. So this has to do with how Splatoon's hero modes and Octo Expansion were kind of all about just like in the hero modes beating the ever-living daylight out of the Octarians to get our way back and to preserve our way of life. And then Octo Expansion was, was all about how Tartar doesn't think the Inklings are worthy of having the Earth because of their trivial fashion choices, he says. So yeah, he decides to go and wipe the world out because of that. So, I, I guess this is technically true. Uh, once again, kids game. Gambit AI remnants are not nearly as scary as they sound. Gambit was the code name of Splatoon 1 and the AI remnants part are remnants from the AI from stuff like rival Octolings that were ported over to Blitz. And Blitz, if you didn't know, is the developer code name of Splatoon 2. So it sounds a lot scarier than it actually is when really it's just simple development stuff. YouTube video with Splatoon characters include tips shown on news. So while the actual clip that I'm about to show is not really dark or scary at all, I just would like to indicate beforehand that if you are having a hard time with any thoughts like that, you might just want to skip out on this entry altogether. But if you think you can handle it, it's literally just Splatoon characters with the audio from a Filthy Frank video in the background. So. It's really not that bad, but if you can't handle it today, it's totally okay and I would understand why. And there's always people you can turn to for help if you're having a really hard time like that. But I will now play the little clip that made the news right for you here. And yeah, it, it is a little goofy. Yeah, Jack, shocked is an understatement for sure. These videos have actually teach kids how to successfully commit s It's grabbing a lot of attention around the country. Your child could be watching this video. Looks harmless. It's just some cartoon characters, and then this pops up. Remember, kids, sideways for attention, long ways for results. 
A Florida mom found this video along with other YouTube kid videos that encourages at the crisis center in Birmingham. Abby Latofsky says these videos could be a huge trigger. When they are exposed to things like this, it can help them feel like there's nothing, you know, no way out or that things aren't getting better. They have a 24 seven crisis hotline to help those that are feeling and they also have a new texting service during evening hours. Parents I spoke to say these videos are disturbing. They just are the generation of the age that they just don't know what to believe and they just believe their peers. Um, and so it just breaks my heart when I hear and see stories and of people that just get sucked up into the lies of, of the world. It shocks me, it angers me, and I'm glad that they took it down. Latofsky says she's sadly not shocked that these videos exist. She says now they're talking to kids in elementary school about the she just hopes these kind of videos stop appearing on the web. It's really worrisome because kids are so vulnerable at such a young age, and we know that kids are Everyone exposed to and okay. way too many young people die by that already, that anything that encourages or exposes kids to is, is terrible. Now, those videos that we just showed you have been taken down by YouTube Kids and YouTube. Latoski says all parents should talk to their kids about and let them know there is help. Hillary Simon, CBS 42 News, local coverage you can count on. Well, everyone, that is it. That was Sack Squid's Splatoon Iceberg. The link to the original iceberg will be in the description, along with any other videos that weren't mine shown off here today. It was really cool to take a trip down memory lane like this again. Whether it's your first time seeing this or you haven't seen it since I made my first videos on these back in, like, early 2021, I hope you all walk away from this knowing a little bit more about Splatoon than you did coming in here. I actually had to re-research a lot of these because it's been so long since I'd broken down this iceberg, and also like half of this video is now re-recorded because I originally lost the audio, so there's a nice like hour of my life I won't get back. But anyways gamers, that is it from me. Make sure to leave a like and a comment, like seriously now more than ever, the extra engagement will help spread this video around to more people. And trust me, with how much heart, soul, and time I have poured into this video, I would really appreciate if it gets seen. If you can't think of anything to comment but still want to help out, leave the word iceberg. Any engagement helps out. Alright gamers, that is it from me. See ya.